Harry Belafonte has been honored many times by such diverse groups as the American Jewish Congress, the NAACP, the City of Hope, Fight for Sight, the Urban League, the National Congress of Black Mayors, the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rath, the ACLU, the State Department, the Boy Scouts of America, Hadassah International, and the Peace Corps. He received such awards as the Albert Einstein Award from Yeshiva University, the Martin Luther King Peace Prize, the ACORN Award for the Bronx Community College for his work with children, and in 1990-89, he received a pre prestigious Kennedy Center Honors for Excellence in the Performing Arts. He was the first recipient of Nelson Mandela Courage Award and was honored at the White House with the 1994 National Medal of Arts from President Clinton. It is an honor and a privilege for me as a left forum board member to present to you Mr. Harry Belafonte. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. And thanks to the left forum and to each and every one of you gathered here. Most of the time when I go around the country speaking to young people, a great portion of that population resides in the universities of America, but also a large part of that constituency resides in the institutions of incarceration. Uh, I make it my business to be there with great constancy and to listen to ideas and thoughts and hopes expressed by young men and women caught in that terrible space on ways in which we might be able to reverse historic trends. Sometimes uh, that task becomes more daunting than I had ever uh, thought. And I say that not, not coming from a place of naivete. I, I've been in the left and been involved with the politics of the left for most of my life, starting in a measurable way with my volunteer to being in the United States Armed Forces during the Second World War, going after the villains uh, that uh, raped our planet, going out to fascism and Hitler and Mussolini and Tojo and capitalism. And uh, in that struggle, I met all the inspiration I needed to uh, not only constantly remind me that the path I had chosen to take was an honorable one, but also a very productive one, to share the experiences of Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois and Paul Robeson and Eleanor Roosevelt and many others was my good fortune to uh, have those people fuel my thoughts and my ideas and my commitment to the things that I do. My most recent agenda has been dealing with a problem that I saw on a television screen not too many years ago. As a matter of fact, to measure it precisely, it was at the very time that Katrina happened down in the Gulf. On the day that that horrible event was taking place, there was a breaking news on television. And I saw quite by accident this picture of a five-year-old black child. Her name is Aisha Scott. Aisha was in her classroom, and the picture showed her being cruelly thrown across the desk in her class and her arms being thrust up behind her and she was being handcuffed by three white police officers. Uh, the image was startling. The horror on young Scott's face was even more bewildering. And I gazed wondering what in the world could this child possibly have done to create this moment of drama. And I called a friend of mine by the name of Connie Rice. Connie is a black attorney. She's one of the leaders and founders of an organization called the Advancement Project. And I call her often on issues of criminal justice and problems that face the youth because her work 
is not only in poverty law, but also in the law dealing with criminal justice. And I asked her, did she know of this uh, event that was taking place in Florida? And she responded by saying, yes, that uh, as a matter of fact, attorneys from Advancement Project were moving in on the case and they were beginning to uh, examine the details. She pointed out, however, that although it had not yet reached pandemic proportions, it was a crisis and a tragedy that was worth taking note of because it was on the build, it was on the rise. Many children in America, from the ages of 10 and below, were being roughed up by the criminal justice system. And a lot of the schools were beginning to rely on that system for things that uh, the schools itself had failed to do. When I looked at Aisha Scott's face, I made it my business to not only send staff and myself becoming very much involved, but it forced me to call for the first time in my life a gathering of, we called it the gathering of the elders. And at that gathering, we had a broad cross-section of personalities that made up the movement, that made up the concerned institutions on criminal justice issues. And at that place, a, a lot of very famous names showed up. Cornell West, Farrakhan, uh, Marion Wright Edelman. Uh, the list was vast, a lot of elected officials and government. And the charge was, had you seen what happened to Aisha Scott and where are we going in America when the new uh, indecencies and the new indiscretions were now being heaped upon our children and they seem to be defenseless in the face of this tyranny. What were we doing about it? What did we have to say? And one person after the other got up and spoke eloquently and passionately and said things uh, that fortunately for us was all filmed. It was on tape from the opening remarks to the closing events a day later. And upon examining the material and reflecting on all that had been said, it occurred to those of us gathered around this moment that our colleagues, who were all well-intentioned, who were all bright and honorable people, who were passionate and had more than once expressed acts of huge bravery by stepping into the face of tyranny, as many had done it, particularly during the civil rights movement or during the more active days of the civil rights movement. I get caught like others in thinking of it as something of the past, but in fact it is a constant and it is always something of the present. But those who had been into that fray had more than on one occasion expressed bravery in the things that they did. Some paid for those acts with their lives. They were murdered and uh, oppressed vigorously by the state. And yet, now here they were at this gathering that we called. And I discerned from what our analysis said of those speeches that uh, they were not the right front line. Although they would have a purpose to serve, what was missing was the face and the presence of a large swath of young people. So we held another meeting down in Epps, Alabama, among black farmers who gave us their facility and their space to bring youth from all over America, from north and south, east and west. And uh, hundreds showed up and we had a thing called the gathering. Uh, we met and we talked about gang issues about community tyranny, about what was happening to each and every one of them as they saw the picture. That meeting revealed that with all the common issues that all the young had uh, with each other, there was still something very vital missing. 
There was no rooted ideology. There was no rooted space to debate and do analysis based upon targets that had been set for how relief would reveal itself. The young people hardly even knew each other, yet they had an inordinate propensity for killing one another. All these black young people gathered in Ems hardly knew other people living in their own communities. <clears throat> and what was concluded was that uh, we needed to do more of an outreach. We needed to more about, know more about who we were and what were the specifics of the suffering and the indignities we were experiencing. The group from Memphis, Alabama moved out to California up in Santa Cruz and met with a large number of Latino representatives from communities and gangs and gang uh, activists. Barrios Unidos, under the leadership of Nani Alejandro, put the Latino group together and the Bloods and the Crips from LA and others from all over the country met in Berkeley and for two and a half days we held a conference and for the first time, not for the first time, that's not quite true, but for yet another time escalated significantly, Latinos and blacks came together to talk about what's up. In that conversation, they felt that even what they were saying to one another, which revealed great commonality in suffering, as well as great commonality in how purpose could be designed, they reached out to the indigenous. They went among the Native American communities onto the reservations, and for three days they were housed by several tribes that came together in Onondaga here in New York. And uh, for three days we talked. We sat in a circle and discussed issues that faced the young people among Latinos, blacks, and indigenous. That group then decided to go down to Appalachia and to meet with uh, white folks that were deeply immersed in poverty, the cruelty of the labor in which many of them were involved in was the miners, and we spoke among ourselves from that time until now. They have met with great regularity. They've stayed together as a group. They call themselves The Gathering. Just recently, they have uh, gone on the web, excuse me, <clears throat> and been coming together with, uh, with great regularity to talk about solution. And before setting specific targets, what they began to do was to look at history and to look at those who had preceded them. How did we greet the onslaught of pain and anguish and cruelty that we experienced with the forces here and in other parts of the world? <clears throat> what many young people were surprised to uh, have recalled for them was the fact that many of them who were sitting in the room at these gatherings were younger than many of the people who had made it the heart of the civil rights movement. A lot of them didn't realize that uh, John Lewis was 18, that Julian Bond was 18, Diane Nash was 17 and a half with a child, and she was one of the great voices in the f Southern Freedom Movement. She created uh, the armada of bus resistance and all that went on with the violence of that experience. And when these young people began to look that uh, Dr. King, when he stepped into the space, was 26. And when I met him, I was 28. And here we were talking. And uh, when I looked at Martin, we realized that in our little small group, we were the elders. And uh, thank God that many of us had been touched by and embraced by men and women like the ones I mentioned earlier. They stepped into the space and gave us ideas and counsel. In reaching out to the world at large, my life with uh, Africa uh, from the time of Jomo Kenyatta and the Mau Mau Rebellion and what went on with people like uh, who had come to this country. Most of them I met uh, in the United Nations through Eleanor Roosevelt who had just finished working on the Declaration of Human Rights. She had brought together many young Africans who were aspiring for independence and working towards shaping their own nations in a new way. They came 
to the United Nations as visitors to articulate in forums, and they spoke to us, and I got a big handle on what was going on and committed myself to the liberation fronts in Africa that were waging a war against their oppression. That led me to a deep involvement with the ANC and Oliver Tambo and all of the people who made up that great movement. And now, most recently, in a very stunning and extremely painful uh, observation, I watched 34 miners in South Africa, men made up of only the desire to get a better wage, most of whom could not read or write. When we saw pictures of them, they voted on the various promises put before them. They voted by a thumbprint. They didn't know how to write. And this group, with no weapons, standing strong in the style of nonviolence, was surrounded by the state police, by the will of the state, as the film, there's a film out called uh, Miners Shot Down. It's currently on release and in distribution. I'd recommend very strongly that, uh, uh, that each and every one of you, if you've not seen that film, that you make it a part of your repertoire, that you make it a part of your daily life. What I do with moments like that film and other things is I keep a constant piece of technology alive with their voices. All of Dr. King's speeches are in my computer. I tap into it any time of the day or night when I need a reference to memory that helps me stay the course. I have the speeches of... I have the speeches of Malcolm X and I have Farrakhan and I have Nelson Mandela and I just have it in. It's either that or The Tonight Show. And I find more stimulus coming from my computer. But I do that even in the offices in which we work. The paintings and the relief that we have on the walls are all about the history of our, the life on our planet. This is where I now reside. I sit deeply wounded and deeply concerned that Zuma and that the ANC in South Africa has abandoned its calling. They have become, thank you, they have become the new tyranny. And this is a hard pill to swallow. How could Zuma, how could Ramaphosa, and how could all of those people who were the beneficiaries of the great struggle against apartheid, who took over the army and the nation and the political machine, they did not control the economics of the nation, but that could come. And it was something that was tooled so cleverly and with great wisdom by Madiba, by Nelson Mandela. How could all this have gone so awry? How could Zuma and how could his government stand up and with weapons of destruction shoot down and kill 34 miners who are striking for a better wage? These were forces that started in the left. They were forces that spoke to all the great philosophers of the past history of the left. Those who left guidance and mileposts and, and things that we could call upon. How did power so crucify these people that now they are the ones who are murdering their own? Where did we blink? What happened in that this is how we have wound up? Here in America, where is, in fact, the left? Many of us are here gathered. We speak. But uh, where is the left that we knew that uh, had so served the labor movement? Where are the unions? Where are all the churches that had once upon a time served through instruments of liberation theology in the 
in the tradition of Dr. King. What happened? Where did they go? What have they become? And how, we, how do we now instruct our young people as they're asking for guidance? Who do we turn them to? What do we inform them about? Whom do we set up as the faces that they should see reflected in the mirrors of their lives? Where do we go for the greater truth? And currently I'm on that campaign. I'm on that march. I'm on that, I'm in that space. What delights me and gives me a great sense of hope is that although there's a great absence of ideological theory and, and uh, development, and, uh, because I think uh, the system has been most clever in how it is you, you erased radical dialogue, radical speech, radical thinking. They've, they've, they've robbed our universities of it. They've robbed, they've robbed, robbed the pulpits of America with it. They have robbed our political process from it. There is no vast arena of radical thought being revealed to our young people who desperately need to know what the choices are and can't get it. All the instruments uh, that have been traditionally responsible for informing no longer inform. Many of them no longer exist. In the face of that, I had occasion to give a speech in the most unlikely place, a big festive evening for black narcissism. narcissism. We were gathered with uh, uh, image awards and Hollywood and uh, everybody came together to talk about how great I am, meaning I with a pronoun being them. <laughs> but, uh, and I spoke about the carnage of the gun, the violence that had washed our cities with the blood of our children. And I charged that community filled with celebrities of being absent, of being part of the problem instead of being a part of the solution. I pointed out. I pointed out that never in our nation had we had such a harvest of celebrity. So many black people, highly profiled, not just in art and culture, but also in, in sports, in all the places in which we had great visibility. We have young men and women sitting in the halls of legislation, in cities and in our federal government. And we have so many who are dealing with industry, some who are the captains of industry some who had some of the most powerful corporations in this country are men and women of color. Well, where are they as a collective? Where are they even as individuals? Where are they in the preciseness of what's necessary in dealing with the carnage that has now given us the largest prison population in the world? And I gotta tell you, when the New York Times in a Sunday editorial has to take time to breathe on that subject, and then reports it with some sense of accuracy, telling the truth that America is beyond the pale, that they're now in a place that they better hurry up and pay great attention to because we may not be able to retrieve ourselves when the New York Times begins to scream out against the fact that uh, uh, in cause or mass incarceration is the new slavery, using the terminology of Marion Wright Edelman, as she often says, when she speaks about, when she says that and the New York Times says it, I think maybe somebody better pay attention. They're telling us something. <laughs> My coming here today uh, is really about the fact that in that space, we created yet another dynamic. It calls itself Sankofa. It was picked by guys who would make up the Bloods and Crips out of California at a peace powwow that we were having. <coughs> and when looking at uh, where we go uh, with uh, putting culture in the service of activism, all of the most powerful, highly profiled citizens that have gotten the public attention, they're being charged with the responsibility of using the platform to begin to make films, to do songs, to turn it around, particularly targeting the hip-hop community. 
And in that community, many of the highly profiled rappers who are uh, successful, who are gaining platform and, and recognition, stepped into the space and said, we're in. We're going to have to start to look at another way to frame the way we do our poetry. Uh, we have to look at another way in which we are treating women, the things that we have said, and, I'm, and what we're doing. <laughs> So between Sankofa and the gathering and young people in the sphere in which I reside, and uh, many of whom are in institutions of learning, uh, studying uh, uh, radical literature, radical philosophers, uh, studying on methodology and what to do and how to beat the system, <clears throat> many of them say to me, uh, gee, you know, you had it easier in your time. And in a way, they're right, because we did have signs. We did have visible daily expressions that were ordered by the state, were the, were, the, were the plantings of the state. And our death and our mayhem was the harvest of the state. Today, you don't have signs down south that say, no Negroes, no colored, no niggers. Uh, you, have, you don't have it quite that visible. The Klan does its mischief but fewer bodies hang on the trees uh, in the South and in other places. Uh, sometimes uh, they don't have to worry too much about that because uh, the state and the death systems in the state fill that space adequately by putting so many <laughs> to death. But a lot of young people are beginning to feel a sense of the urgency of coming together, of forming a, a bigger alliance, looking for ways in which to be able to get to the truth more succinctly and in depth. And we're doing all we can to lead them to those places and into those paths. One of the things that we did with some of the people in the gathering and in Sankofa was to put together a delegation that went to Africa. And uh, they spent some time in Africa looking at the, the plight of their counterpart. I had occasion to do that in the middle of the days of the great civil rights upheaval by taking Fannie Lou Hamer and Bob Moses and uh, uh, John Lewis and Julian Bond, a group of activists who needed desperately to have another frame of reference for what we were doing in our struggle here at home. And out of Montgomery, Alabama, I'm sorry, Greenwood, Mississippi, that's where we were. We all went to West Africa and spent time with our African brothers and sisters, learned of their struggle. And I think that John Lewis and Julian Bond and those who were there will tell you that that became an epiphany for them. It was a turning point. They saw the depth and the breadth of our struggle. They saw the universal order of things. They saw that the enemy which was common to us here was also the same presence there crucifying the people of uh, the developing world, those who are in the first world to begin with. They were experiencing many things that we were experiencing here, and yet now we were just making this alliance. It has not yet completely bridged itself. There's still a lot of work to do, but many are on the path. Many are on the way. What I am now looking at is where do we go in America? The Koch brothers have uh, named the game. Uh, they have cl certainly clarified the issues. They have told us unfinchingly that uh, they're ready to murder all of us. They're ready to see us go into places of pain and anguish. They care very little for our humanity because they have lost their own. They look at us and they make laws and rules. <laughs> that are more insidious the way in which they do business than the Ku Klux Klan is. At least they got sheets with a hole in the eye and uh, they, they're far more visible. These people work cleverly under the radar screen. And so insidious is the movement that I, as a New Yorker living in what I consider to be a fairly informed city, 
I go to Lincoln Center, where I used to see the New York State Theater for the Performing Arts. That building is now retitled. It is now Coke Auditorium. Coke Auditorium. I had some films and some stuff that I'm doing with PBS, and all of a sudden, what was a clear path to continuing to do the work that we do was all of a sudden impeded, caught up in, in bureaucratic uh, games. And what I love deeply, it is just that uh, the institution had just received a huge, huge financial benefit from the Koch brothers, and now they were renaming the game for public broadcasting. Huh, that's interesting. And then I go to uh, Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. Between that and Harlem Hospital, my youth was well accounted for. Uh, I looked at this institution, and I looked and uh, I saw that in the struggles of 1199, and hospital workers looking for what the miners were looking for, a better wage, a better system in which to do business as workers, that all of a sudden, uh, Columbia Presbyterian doesn't want to come to the table. And they don't feel compelled to do that because now their new resource, Koch brothers. They put a fortune on the table to that hospital, building a new pavilion that will be called the Koch Pavilion. So while we look at the Koch brothers for the fundamental mischief that they do in the politics of our lives, they've surrounded us and they're taking over our institutions of culture. They take out ads and they do things to make them a household, uh, a part of the, our household menu, to make us more familiar with their names and to see them in humane light, which is really very clever in coming up the deeper agenda, which is gerrymandering uh, the politics of each state. They have uh, changed the way in which the voting machine takes place. They've captured North Carolina. They've taken over Florida. Georgia just passed a whole new set of laws. And the current administration is not, has chosen not to pay much attention to the cruelty of uh, 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 the law. We can still be arrested. We can still be put upon and spirited away into the night onto the name of uh, Homeland Security. That law that still sits, which was part of the campaign for Barack Obama, when he said we'll change the way in which the previous administration did business, uh, that uh, the Guantanamo and political prisoners and torturing them and all the things that we were doing is unacceptable, it's against the ideals of America, it's morally uh, bankrupt. All the platitudes and all the things we needed to hear him say, he said, except Guantanamo is still there. I'm quite sure terrorizing these human beings to yield information that they have long since agreed has yielded nothing that has changed the, the, the face of our, our struggle and our human condition. All of this, yet the law still sits, and nobody makes a noise about it. What is perhaps, and I will close now, <laughs> what really disturbs me and what I hope this forum will be able to yield some vision as to what we can do about it, what bothers me is that the oppressed has become so mute, that the oppressed has become so accommodating of the villainy that's being heaped upon us. And without their noise, without their rebellion, without they being in the forefront of the charge to change all this shit, uh, we, we are at a standstill. For those uh, who are watching us this evening, or globally or wherever, especially the artists, I'm reminded that uh, some have stepped into this space thinking that uh, to be part of a, the movement of change would be some weekend delight, only to find that when they stepped into the space, uh, the sting is severe. And some have pulled back. 
I remember uh, a story. Uh, it goes back away, but it's, it's illustrative of, of, of the kind of intimidation that can leap on us. My best friend is Sidney Poitier, and I called him one day because I was asked by SNCC, by James, Jim Foreman, and others down in Greenwood, Mississippi to come down with some money. They needed, it was right at the end of the, the voter registration period in the summer. All the students were on their way back to go register for the new semester. It was near the end of their, their tour of duty. And that was at just at the time that Shirley Goodwin and Cheney had been abducted and eventually murdered. And uh, all of the youth, it was felt by the movement that if all the young people were to leave at the time they were to leave, it would appear as if somehow they had fled in the face of that terror and that we were therefore leaving out of terror rather than what had been contractually arranged. They'd come down for a certain period of time and then go back to start the new semester. Well, many of those students, upon debate and analysis, decided to stay. To keep them there, we needed a lot of money. And I was called to say, could I help fill that space? And I talked with uh, Jamie, and I said, well, how much do you need? And came close to $100,000. Actually, the figure was 70. Uh, and I said, uh, well, he said, you know, we need to put food on the table for these young people. We need to have housing. We need transportation. We need all kind of logistical infrastructure stuff. So I said, I will do what I can to raise the money. Uh, but incidentally, uh, when I get it, where do I send it? Well, we found out that the Western Union was off the book, off the table. There was no existing mechanism to send it down because it would look, it would, it would be an invitation to suicide if some young black worker were to walk up to the Western Union office locally and say, I'm here to pick up $70,000 from, <clears throat> from Harry Belafonte. Uh, that's the last we could see of the person and the money. So we agreed that uh, I had to deliver it personally. And in doing that, I had some thoughts on mortality that uh, somehow is just not negotiable. And that I thought it would be far more difficult for the opposition to talk about killing me uh, if there was more than just me. Uh, so my idea was for a group of us with high uh, public profile to take the charge to go on down to, to Mississippi. So I called, uh, first one I called was Sydney. And I always called Sydney to go away on vacation. I said, uh, yo, Sid, uh, what you doing this weekend? And he said, he said I'm cool, man. I'm open. Well, what's up? I said, well, I got to make a trip, and I'd like you to make it with me. You got it. Where are we going? And I said, Greenwood, Mississippi. <laughs> it was a long pause, folks. <laughs> and he said, uh, what you going down to Greenwood, Mississippi for? Then I told him the story. Then there was another pause. And he said, uh, Belafonte, let me tell you something. Uh, I'm going. I'll go. Uh, when we come back, if we come back, <laughs> you're going to have to do me one favor. Never, ever call me again. <laughs> many, many of my colleagues with the high profile that we're talking to are sitting down right now with the phone still in their hand. They're wondering what the cost will be for stepping into this fray and trying to make a difference. And I inform them there'll be a price to pay. But then the question falls upon you. What price are you prepared to pay for freedom? What price are you prepared to pay for justice?
Another round of applause for Mr. Harry Belafonte.